Hello? Hi. We're going to get started. Sorry, it's a little late. Sorry. <laughs> Better late than never, right? Uh, I'm Courtney Waldwickup. I'm with the Blue Acres program at the state of New Jersey. And uh, we're going to get started on this session. I'm hoping everybody can hear me. Can you hear me in the back? Yes, good. OK, great. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about encouraging, or maybe even it's better said, enabling homeowners to relocate to uh, safe places after they accept a buyout or a relocation. Um, and I want to talk about kind of where the idea came from before we kind of get into anything else. Um, but one of the goals here was really to kind of open up a dialogue. We know that this could happen in a lot of different ways, but we wanted to kind of give you an example of what New Jersey's trying for the first time and also what Louisiana's kind of been doing. And then we really want you to talk about what else we're missing, right? Like what other solutions are out there that we should be considering. Um, with me today it, um, online is James Mooney, and he's the head of the Smart Move program. This is based in the Department of Community Affairs uh, in the state of New Jersey. He's sort of my counterpart over there. Um, I'll give you a quick overview of Blue Acres. Several of you have probably heard of us, so it's, it's not necessarily a real in-depth conversation about the program. We can always do that offline. Um, and then finally, we have um, Pat Forbes from Louisiana, and he's going to talk a little bit about their experiences. Um, we're going to try and have some room for conversation at the end in dialogue, so I encourage you to use the mics at that point in time. Okay? All right. So I'm going to jump right in, if that's okay. And each of the speakers will kind of introduce themselves a little bit beforehand. I didn't, since we're short on time, I didn't want to kind of go through all everybody's bio. So Blue Acres, again, we're New Jersey's state-led buyout program. Uh, we take very seriously that flooding is a big problem in New Jersey. We sort of toggle back and forth between third and fifth on the list of states for the most repetitive lost properties. So we know we deal with flooding both in a, both in a coastal and in a riverine environment. Our, um, our buyout program, why does it never work when you want it to? All right, I'll just talk. Don't worry about it. Oh, there we go. Um, so our buyout program started in the kind of 90s, late 90s. Um, it began really with trying to buy out some riverine properties in conjunction with the Army Corps. Um, and then over time, we started to do specific state-led work. Uh, we have bought out over, I guess it was over 85 properties between 2010 and 2012 using some FEMA hazard mitigation money. Uh, we also have dedicated state funding for buyouts. Uh, we get a portion of the corporate business tax that allows us to do 100% state funded work, or we'll use the funding to leverage some of the federal money that's out there. Um, but like a lot of states in the Northeast and, and in the South, um, Sandy was kind of a game changer. It really kind of put our buyout program on steroids is, is sort of the, the phrase we often use. And what I mean by that is we kind of ramped up very quickly to spend an awful lot of money. And it was the first time that, that Green Acres, Blue Acres, and the Department of Environmental Protection had to figure out how to use like over $250 million worth of money. And we knew how to write the FEMA grants. We had never worked with HUD. Um, and we had never really done kind of all of the, the pieces that go along with um, a program on that scale. You know, we were born of an open space program, so we knew how to acquire open space to add to parks or wildlife management areas, but we didn't necessarily know how to do all this homeowner engagement and all of this kind of problem solving that comes with um, a buyout program at this level. And we learned really fast. So we made um, over a thousand offers during Sandy. We ended up acquiring um, over 800 properties. I think actually that number is closer to 820. I know I'm showing you 811, but there's like a handful that we kind of closed on after the, what we consider to be the end of the Sandy program. Um, but we've demolished over 765 homes and we've got real creative during our process in that we negotiated some short sale forgiveness for homeowners because as I think um, any of you who were here for the plenary earlier, um, Liz talked a little bit about how a lot of folks were underwater in more than one way, right? They were underwater physically, but they were also underwater financially. And so we did create a team of people to negotiate with lenders and try and get negotiate some short sale forgiveness for homeowners. Um, and I think they managed over about $2 million worth of forgiveness um, to secure on behalf of homeowners. Um, and we did buy some rental properties, so we did have to follow the Uniform Relocation and Real Property Act um, and make sure that those tenants were relocated. And so there were about 45 tenant households that were relocated. 
This is just a quick overview of our process, and, and I bring this slide up mainly to talk about the first part. Um, Blue Acres was recently realigned into the Office of Climate Resilience, um, and this was a strategic move that was done within the Department of Environmental Protection to really make sure that we're not just reacting and buying things out after an event, but that we're proactively planning for these kind of buyouts. Um, and, and we're looking at kind of that relocation conversation and those buyout conversations as a way to address the climate vulnerability New Jersey has. You know, inland we're recognizing that our precipitation rates are increasing at an alarming rate. I think our state climatologist said it's about a 7% increase in precipitation. So these storms are coming, they're lingering longer, they're dropping more water, and there's a lot more flash flooding. And Ida, which impacted New Jersey in um, September of 2021, really demonstrated that for us. We had about 30 people die as a result of flash flooding, and a lot of that was in cars, homes. Um, it was pretty devastating. And so we, we realized we can't just kind of treat this as a problem that looks backwards at the historic data. We also have to look forward at these projections and the realities that we're we're coming to, to grips with. Um, so our resilience planning takes a couple shapes. It, it's about uh, advocating for some regional planning approaches through our Resilient NJ program, as well as kind of having these, uh, what we call resilient buyout conversations with communities and, and local government groups. A lot of times we've tried to have strategic discussions with towns that might share a, a river. Um, so, you know, where they have homes on either side, maybe we can have a joint conversation about being effective on both sides um, to sort of reduce risk. So the, the resilience planning then leads us to, to, to funding opportunities. Again, we have state and federal money, but we do try and leverage where we can because it allows us to help more families. Um, we do the application planning and you know, or the, I should say, we do the planning for the application, but then we develop it. Um, and then we you know, always announce the award in conjunction with the local governments that are involved. The buyout implementation is largely handled by the real estate team at the Green Acres program. So these are a group of people who are, their job every day, they're appraisers, title reviewers, um, surveyors, their job is to kind of do the nuts and bolts of a real estate transaction. Um, we've baked in a, a part of that process where we have case managers. Every family gets a case manager. That's a dedicated person to walk them through each step of the process. It's a single point of contact. It's also somebody who's kind of charged with acting as an advocate on behalf of the homeowner. If they have um, other needs, how do we point them to the right services? So it's an important role. It's one we take a lot of pride in having built into our process, um, but it does kind of, it comes at a cost and it also um, requires that Sometimes we have to slow down in order to get where we ultimately want to go because we have to respect that homeowners have their own timetables. When we talk about um, reporting in demo, these are kind of like the unsexy parts, but they're important, right? This is what gets us to um, what we can restore and how we can have pragmatic conversations with towns and areas about what we can do with this land. And in New Jersey, we've found a, a spectrum on that front. We've found where in some places we get several hundred homes all in the same area and we can do some amazing restoration work. In other cases, we find a couple, three or four, five, 10. Um, that means that it's not necessarily like we're not gonna come back and revisit additional buyouts there, but what you can do in the short term becomes very different if you don't have a lot of land to work with. And so we always have these discussions about post buyout land use and sort of what you can do from a restoration perspective in phases, like let's talk about ideally what you could do, and then let's also talk about what those sort of maybe lesser degrees of success for restoration would look like. Obviously, we're always gonna make sure that we're so, you know, doing this soil stabilization and some of those basic things we need to, but sometimes we want a ton of momentum around these fantastic ideas and these landscape architecture level landscape designs, and sometimes that's not possible if it's a voluntary buyout, right? If homeowners still have to choose, it becomes a little tricky um, if you don't get the full realization of your goal. Um, as I mentioned, again, we have kind of two core functions. We respond after a disaster, but we're also really trying to be proactive about this work. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I won't spend a ton of time here, but we know in New Jersey, a lot of our flood maps are old. So we recognize that if we continue to just kind of plan reactively, we were gonna not be really addressing the full scope of risk. And then I think, um, you know, <laughs> these are some of these are pretty obvious, but um, one of the things that kind of led me to this conversation today is really that 
you know, after the, the 10 or so years post Sandy, we really need to be having more conversations about the role of buyouts and relocation and housing. And that was really sort of the genesis for today's conversation because it doesn't just happen to individuals, it happens to communities. Relocation is, you know, a complicated issue for, for a lot of people. Um, it doesn't necessarily exist in a vacuum. And we have to realize that we have very clear guidance from federal funding sources about how to address relocation for tenants, but there really has been an absence of guidance and dialogue about how you can do that constructively for homeowners. One of the things we're doing after IDA is we've um, created what we refer to as the supplemental assistance and the incentive option in our buyout process. And that is kind of under both funding sources, FEMA and HUD. They have some allowances for adding to buyout offers. Some of this can be used to uh, help them secure replacement housing. So we've done housing analysis of all the counties that were impacted by IDA, and we have figured out a way to kind of justify additions to purchase offers to find suitable replacement housing, but it comes with some strings. So whether you talk about it in the HUD side and you call it an incentive, or you talk about it on the FEMA side and you call it supplemental assistance, it does require that homeowners um, attest that they are moving to replacement housing that is not in the floodplain. Um, so we're, we're sort of incentivizing them by giving them that extra money to say, but you've got to give us an address and assign an affidavit that you're you know, going someplace safer. Um, it's a, it a bit of a risk awareness strategy, but I think it's also um, a way for us to try and document where they're going because we hadn't been doing that historically. But it also gives us an opportunity to say we're trying to make people safer. Along those same lines, we've partnered with the Department of Community Affairs, who's our conduit for HUD money. Um, and we said, you know, one of the hesitations some homeowners had during Sandy was they couldn't find replacement housing they could afford. And sometimes the housing in these flood prone areas was the cheapest in these communities, but it allowed them to have access to school systems or resources that they really wanted to get to. And so we had to be more creative. So we partnered with DCA um, and we created sort of this program jointly to say, let's make something that if a, a participant in the buyout program wants to stay locally, and by locally, we don't necessarily always mean the same town, but in the same general area, they would have preference to get into brand new housing. And so Smart Move is, and I, I don't wanna steal James's thunder because he's gonna talk about it in a minute, but it was really intended to kind of help make sure that we could give people a choice. It's not mandated, but um, they can rent short term if the smart move isn't available to them. It's open to people who are FEMA funded as well as people that are HUD funded um, in terms of the buyouts. So we're trying to provide an option or a solution. We've never done it before. It's an, um, I'll use the term, you know, it's a pilot, um, but we know that we have partners in other states and, and I think that's what Pat's gonna be able to talk a little bit about who have done this kind of thing before. Um, I just want to stress, it's not like a one-size-fits-all solution, but it's, it's sort of the beginning of trying, right? And so um, with that, I'm going to let James take over, and then I'll kind of come back at the end and help facilitate some questions or dialogue if we have time for that. Okay. All right, James, take it away. Thanks, Courtney. I'll share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, good. All right, so Okay, so yeah, today I'm gonna be, my name's Jim Mooney. I'm with the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs, Division of Disaster Recovery and Mitigation. Uh, and I'm the Smart Move Program Manager. Um, so today I just have some slides kind of, um, laying out an overview of what the Smart Move program is. And one thing I will mention, this uh, program is still in development. We're working on the policy uh, as we speak, like right now. Um, but this at least gives you some type of background of what we're aiming towards. And I think this is a great opportunity to have this conversation today because uh, there might be something that we're missing in here or something that uh, someone else has that could... Uh, be beneficial to the program. So with that, I'll jump in. So again, like Courtney said, it is a pilot program um, designed to subsidize the development of quality, energy efficient, resilient, and affordable single family housing 
in lower risk areas within or near disaster impacted communities. Um, we will provide um, safe housing for relocating residents so they may stay in or near their impacted communities. And this applies to Blue Acres uh, participants as well as eligible first time home buyers. Uh, we did realize that, you know, with the timing of everything, we couldn't have the full program go towards just Blue Acres residents. There may be some other uh, first time home buyers that may need to fill those units. And DCA will competitively select communities to participate in the pilot program. And we could talk about that in a little further down in some of the other slides. Uh, the developments are to be built outside of the 500 year floodplain and at least 70% of the units uh, will be sold to LMI households. So with developing the program, we really have um, a two phased approach because it's almost like it's two programs within one. And the first uh, part of the program, first phase is the housing development. So that's working with the, our communities and getting developers and the land and building the actual units. And then we have phase two, which is getting the Blue Acres residents or Blue Acres participants and any eligible home buyers to move into the units. And we'll go through the application process and everything. Um, and one, one thing that's important to note, housing developments must be in one of the most impacted and distressed counties. So one of the mid counties. So talking about phase one, housing development, the eligible applicants for the housing development are the local jurisdictions such as cities, townships, counties, all located within the designated MIDs. Local jurisdictions will procure developers and enter into a development agreement. And the local jurisdiction serving as the subrecipient will be responsible for efforts necessary to carry out activities. So some of the application requirements for the developers and the communities now, uh, the information required on the application includes, but is not limited to. So these are just some of the things that we wanna see when the communities apply with their developers. And that's the site selection and neighborhood compatibility, site control, land use and entitlements, parcel and tract maps, market analysis, project budget, including reasonable costs and cost estimates, uh, the construction plans themselves, the development team, and project readiness to see, you know, if it's if the project's ready to go or not, or how long it'll take them to get started. Next, we have the housing development project requirements. So these are the characteristics that will be determined by the subrecipient and or the developer in collaboration with the community. Uh, and we think that's very important to make sure that the developer, the community all have buy-in um, to make it a more successful project. Uh, but all of them must include being located in a designated mid area, possess the financial feasibility and viability criteria. Again, the at least 70% of the development needs to go to LMI households. Uh, we need to meet the required building and construction standards, meet elevation requirements, meet or exceed green and energy efficiency standards, meet resiliency standards, and each uh, development must contain a minimum of six single family housing units. Next, we have the public infrastructure and public infrastructure is critical to community development when constructed in support of housing. Uh, so we wanna make sure that that was included uh, within our uh, projects. And you know, some examples are just streets, sidewalks and curbs, wet utilities, dry utilities, flood and drainage systems, and then any aesthetic improvements. Uh, we wanna make sure that you know, all of that is included within the application when they are applying. Then we also have the construction plans. So the construction plans that um, will be submitted should include the land costs, the infrastructure costs, the number of units that are being built, the breakdown of bedroom sizes, which we're basically doing a two, a three and a four bedroom. Uh, innovative and resilient features. We wanna make sure that applicants have the ability to apply to us with any creative solutions. 
And then the populations being served. Again, knowing that we need to meet that 70% LMI criteria, we'll need to fill that first, but then also we'll have some urgent need applicants. Um, and as well, we could include market rate um, homes that the developer could sell as part of the total development, but it wouldn't be included as any incentive or any funding going towards them, but it just helps the developer. Um, and it all depends on you know, the whole layout of the LMI UN as well, if they wanna include some market rate homes. So one thing that we're um, kind of promoting here is innovative technologies and solutions to um, flooding and any other types of um, disasters. So applicants may incorporate innovative or creative housing typologies to address existing and future housing needs. And these are just some of the examples that we're uh, laying out there, whether it's 3D printed houses, uh, prefabricated homes, fixed foundation, tiny homes, innovative and te uh, technological designs. Uh, pretty much we're leaving it open and we're letting uh, the communities and the developers come to us with their creative solutions. And if they do have some type of um, creative solution that applies, we could uh, address that within the scoring to give them an edge in the uh, selection process. So here we have the developer incentive. Um, we realize that this might be one of the issues, getting developers to wanna participate with the program and build these units. So we're trying to uh, incentivize them here by providing the cost for the infrastructure. We'll provide 30, 40% of the cost for the land. And then we have a developer incentive per each type of housing unit. So again, when they, when they submit their application and they say uh, their breakdown of LMI, UN or market rate units, uh, in this case, they have for an LMI, we would give 50% of the market sales price as an incentive to the developer. 33% of an urgent need uh, could go, of the market sales price go to an urgent need home and any of the market rates, they would not receive any incentive. And this might make all, a little more sense when I walk through the calculation at the end, but I'm just throwing together some of the pieces here. So once we get the developer and the community's application, we're gonna score and select and a review panel will uh, review the applications using criteria that includes, but is not limited to community engagement to make sure that the community's involved with this. We think that that's gonna um, pretty much make it a better overall successful project. Leveraging partnerships, whether they're working with any other communities or developers to uh, come up with these ideas, if they include any in innovative and resilient design project readiness, which is important because we wanna start construction as soon as possible, knowing that some of these Blue Acres um, impacted participants are out of their homes at this point. Uh, and then the mix of housing types and unit sizes, the value of CDBG DR investment, and then demonstrated experience, just making sure that, you know, that whatever team is taking on this challenge, they're ready to, um, or that they've had experience working on something similar. Then we get to our payment process and the payments will be made in accordance with an agreed upon payment schedule. Payments will be processed that establish milestones defined in the development agreement. And uh, DRM will review the draw requests, supporting documentation and conduct a site inspection to confirm the completed work. Final payments will be made after the final inspection and in issuance of a certificate of occupancy. And we're gonna hold a 10% retainage until all the, until the projects are completed and all the homes are sold. Um, and then that will get uh, delivered to the subrecipient. So next we could talk about the phase two, which is the homeowner occupancy. So we're gonna prioritize the homeowner occupancy in the based on this chart that we have here. So phase one is focused on LMI because we need to reach that 70% goal. So Blue Acres participants will come first, followed by any eligible IDA impacted first-time home buyers. 
And we're also going to be looking at people that were in that um, in the jurisdiction that was uh, impacted by Ida. And then after that, we'll go into phase two, where again, we'll prioritize the Blue Acres participants for urgent need, and then any first time home buyers. Next, the sale to the home buyer. So DCA will manage the application review and award process for residents who acquire the new units. Applicants will be required to attend a HUD, a, a meeting with a HUD certified housing counselor to understand the responsibilities and costs associated with home ownership. We wanna make sure that pretty much applicants are aware if these are first time home buyers that they understand that taxes and homeowners insurance can be major costs um, um, as a homeowner and you know anything going wrong. So we just wanna set them up for success. And then applicants must provide a mortgage approval letter to DRM to establish an affordable affordability minimum. And we'll talk about that more when we go through the calculation. Uh, and then DRM and the applicant will sign an agreement for down payment assistance prior to closing with the developer. So the down payment assistance to the homeowner uh, will be offered to ensure affordability. And basically, again, it's going by, depending on your uh, level of income, if you are LMI, you can receive 20% uh, of the market sales price as a down payment assistance. If you're in urgent need, you can receive 10% of the market sales price. And if it's a market rate home, they're not eligible for any down payment assistance. So this is kind of the calculation that kind of ties everything together that I've talked about so far. And I just have one example here, kind of a simple breakdown of a market sale price at 400,000. And then the comparison between if it was an LMI um, unit or an urgent need unit. So for this example, if you look at the incentive to developer for the LMI, again, they'll be getting 50%. So 50% of 400 is your 200,000. Then you have your 33%, which would be 120. So that's what the developer would be receiving per unit. Then if you subtract the difference there, you'll get the discounted sales price to the applicant. So you're starting with the LMI at 200,000, the urgent need at 280. And then we could supply our down payment assistance for the applicants. So here, the LMI is 20% of the market sale price would be 80,000. And for the urgent need, it would be 10%, which would be 40,000. So when you get to the bottom there and you do the math, you come up with your remaining project cost. So for the LMI applicant, they would have $120,000 that they would need to complete the project, which is the amount that they would need to show us in the mortgage approval letter. So, um, and for the UN, it would be 240,000. So that's the important part there where the applicant needs to get approved for a mortgage in order to be eligible as well. And that's all I have for today, for right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. That That's super interesting. We I, I, I just learned some new ideas. That was fabulous. I'm Pat Forbes uh, from Louisiana Office of Community Development. Our, our work is spending CDBGDR money and, and mitigation money, et cetera. Um, so just, okay. So the first thing I wanted to show is sort of uh, what migration looks like in Louisiana. And these data are actually old. This is post Katrina and Rita. In 2005, we had some big hurricanes hit us and uh, started looking some 10, 12 years later at where people were going, how many people were going, that kind of thing. 
and we saw some very real migration trends away from the coast. Uh, and the one thing that I'm sure all of you are aware of is that the people who stay for the most part are those who can't afford to leave. That's not always the case. There are certainly people who are staying in their community because that's where their ancestors grew up and, and, and uh, people who are just simply tied to the land and are never going to go. That, that, that's absolutely uh, part of the equation, but it, uh, money is also a big part of the equation, of course. Uh, and you can see some of the retreat places, some of the receiving areas are uh, inland, pretty good bit, a lot safer. Some are not so much safer. So that's a kind of a, uh, an interesting uh, revelation for us. After Katrina and Rita, we had something called the Road Home Program, which was essentially a, a, a program to let help people rebuild their homes. But they had an option. They didn't have to rebuild where they were. They could take that same grant amount and go invest it somewhere else in another house, sell their house. We were not uh, uh, prohibiting develop further development of the house if they left it there. But uh, what that did ostensibly was give people an opportunity to go somewhere safer. Some folks did, some folks didn't go very far. I think if any of you saw the article from the folks at Rice this week, uh, people don't generally move very far when they migrate away from damage, maybe five miles at the most. Um, so this is what our retreat has looked like. And, and again, these data are old. We've got now, uh, since then in Southwest Louisiana, we had Hurricane Ike. We had uh, Hurricanes Laura and Delta in 2020, and we really are getting a, a huge out migration from the coast, especially in Southwest Louisiana. The interesting thing to note here is that the local governments there, like the first thing I did after Laura and Delta, which was in Southwest Louisiana, it's very rural, was go talk to the local government folks and say, look, we've got buyout programs. We will be standing up buyout programs with CDBG money, and they said, uh, we don't want anything to do with that. We don't want our people, our taxpayers leaving the parish, et cetera. And so that's, a, that's not the only place that it happened in our state. So it's an inter interesting dynamic to keep in mind. This is a projection of uh, the 100 year flood levels 50 years from now. We've put, since Katrina and Rita, a lot of money into the science of understanding coastal land loss and what those projections look like. And so we've got projected land loss and consequently uh, 100 year flood levels for 50 years from now. And you can see that uh, my, my, a colleague of mine used to call the, the, the map that you all think of of Louisiana the cartoon map because the state doesn't really look like that at all. The bottom is sort of a fringe. You can see the bayous and the, where the land is a little bit higher. That's where everybody lives. So we really don't have a lot of room for, for moving safely to a place very close when you're in the coast. Um, and you can also see the effect of levees here. There are projected levees built into the things. If you look at this blue uh, Oh, area right there, that's completely surrounded by a levee. Of course, the city of New Orleans is all of this is the boundaries of a levee. And once you get outside of there, uh, the, the flood levels, the projected flood levels are extremely high. You can see 15 feet. How do you, uh, how do you manage building up on 15 and actually, Flood levels here projected are more like 22 feet. So how do you do that safely and, and keep people there? Um, but as we move forward um, from Katrina and Rita, where it was just sort of uh, haphazard and here you can have the money and move somewhere safer or that you define to be safer to uh, 
Fast forward to today, we have multiple buyout programs going on. Uh, we do buyouts and reconstructions in floodplains if that's where people want to stay, but we elevate above two feet above the projected base flood elevations. Um, but for buyouts, what we do is insist that you, you, you have to show us your next address, if you will. That's the compliance. And that next address has to be in a safer area. In other words, if you currently live in the 100-year floodplain, you got to be in a 500-year floodplain or out of special flood hazard area entirely to be able to get the the buyout grant from us. Uh, the other thing uh, that we have done in Ile de Jean Charles and Pecan Acres is go build housing in a safer place. That's why I was watching the presentation earlier with so much interest. We, I think that's going to be one of the really big challenges that we face is how do we do that economically? We can't, and I'm super interested in James's presentation. I want to talk to him more about it afterwards, but uh, we have not, frankly, figured out how to do that economically, and we're not going to be able to keep spending at the pace we do right now for housing for folks uh, to, to sustain the buyouts. So these are not going to be alien to anybody here, I'm sure. Uh, it's just uh, essentially, first, we got to get people out of harm's way. But we also want to try to n not have diaspora, if that's possible, right? You, we, you lose. In some cultures, it's not a choice. They are going to stay together. Some communities, I should say, they're, they're going to keep that culture together and they'll they'll move together in some when you get that diaspora, of course, you just lose that community cohesion. That is such a big part of community resilience, more so than infrastructure, even I believe. And uh, so how do we how do we try to build in maintaining that and some of that is about constructing the housing like James is talking about and having a place where people can in fact go and stay together. We sort of saw that after Katrina and Rita, we actually had whole neighborhoods from St. Bernard Parish, which was 97% depopulated after Katrina, whole neighborhoods of people who wanted to live together moved to Livingston Parish upstate and bought in subdivisions there so that they could all still live on the same street so it happens anyway but uh those folks had the financial wherewithal to do that and that's not always the case either um and then of course in the end if we can make if, if we can make everybody else safer through these buyouts and resettlements by using the bought out land as part of nature-based solutions and reconnecting floodplains and enlarging floodplains, so much the better. Um, key point is community engagement. Uh, if you heard Kelly this morning, I was super interested in that. We were able in Ile de Jean Charles to have multiple meetings with all the residents and then to interview, and uh, the person who did the interviews is here, at I think, uh, maybe not in the room today, but um, interview individual families when nobody else was listening and really understand what people want, what their priorities are for a resettlement. And it's critical. And so the next critical step that I was talking to Kelly about after the, la the plenary was how do we scale that up? And it sounds like there are some great ideas out there for how to do that, but we're going to have to figure out how to do that. You can't just go to leadership, to a tribal chief, to a mayor, and understand what the desires and priorities of that group are. Um, oh, that's... Okay, that's it. So that's been probably the biggest learning for us in that process has been uh, how do we how do we engage folks in a, that, that engaging folks at a very very local level is critical to being successful in in moving things and having them engaged in the whole process. This is a picture is from Ile de Jean Charles, but uh, we have a similar uh, 
community called Pecan Acres that we moved to another housing development. In both cases, the residents chose where the land, where the development was going to be made. They helped in an iterative design process in the site layout, in the home design, in the names of the streets, in the names of the new communities, and it is all the difference in the world in terms of success in having people feel engaged in the process and consequently willing to participate in the process, which is huge. We wound up with some 90% uh, of the folks at Ile de Jean Charles choosing to move and, and a similar number, uh, in, actually 100% in Pecan Acres, which is great because we're turning it into a wetland. Um, so, all that said, uh, we have had some learnings in the processes, and it is another thing uh, that was said earlier is that you cannot have, you can't ever figure that you've got the right model because there's no one model. Courtney said it, I think, earlier. We just, you have to look at each situation and figure out what fits and how we're all going to keep getting better by sharing information among ourselves about these things because uh, we I, I don't think anybody's got the answer we've all been at it for such a short period of time but uh, we're all getting better <laughs> so I, I think we can take questions from that. so I want to first start by thanking both James and Pat um, just in case we run out of time. But we do want to give you guys opportunities to ask some questions and just to have some conversation. I'm going to ask if one of the tech folks can hook us up with an extra mic up here so Pat can have one. But I also don't want you to forget about James. He's online, so make sure if you have questions, you uh, let him um, get involved in the conversation. I know sometimes when you are the virtual, um, you know, you kind of get siloed a little bit. And then we may have questions from some of the online participants too, so just keep that in mind. But um, is there somebody from tech who can help us with the mics real quick? Is it hot? Oh, okay. You're good. Check. Okay. We can share? Okay. All right. So um, we already have somebody at the mic. So just do me a favor, introduce yourself before you ask your questions so we all get to know each other a little more. Sure. Thanks. Judy East, uh, Bureau of Resource Information and Land Use Planning in the state of Maine. We had a conference a couple of weeks ago about our particular housing crisis, I think. It's national. And one of the things, this was actually in the development of prefab um, modular home developments, mobile home parks, which in Maine, that's our affordable housing, essentially. And one of the, I, I was a little starstruck by the numbers that um, James went over in terms of just the starting figure. Um, they came down hugely, but one of the things that came up in our conversation was before you could get the certificate of occupancy, there were requirements, as I saw in the list there, for things that I would consider amenities, like sidewalks, um, some streetscaping, and I don't think they're unnecessary, but I'm wondering um, in terms of incentives for developers, whether you've thought about, as you're developing this program, things that can be expenditures after the fact, like those kinds of amenities, I mean, they can be bonded, but that they can be, to get people into those homes faster, I guess. Um, and then also, whether there's any opportunity for this is unique to Maine, maybe, I don't know, because we have a lot of underutilized old housing. Whether there's any incentives in your program for retrofit of existing homes or bonuses to developers who develop where there's already existing infrastructure. Um, so really try to focus to existing services, existing growth areas, as we call them. And any of those sorts of things that bring down the price and imp and speed up the process if you've discussed any of those kinds of things yes we definitely Go have ahead, uh, discussed those um any any type of solution that 
someone can come to us with, we're willing to accept and at least review. I mean, we'll, we'll allow any um, infill or scattered site development as well, because one of the challenges we're working with is a lot of this is in North Jersey where there's not a lot of area available for development. So we've also, you know, thought of, hey, we might have to have one applicant who comes with four or, you know, six homes here and six homes in another site instead of a 12 home, um, just single development. So we're definitely um, allowing all different types of development and, uh, and reuse of any existing structures and infrastructure. And I think to your first question, um, with something like sidewalks, we do want to include, um, we will include that within the infrastructure side of the program. So that will be funded by us. And then the actual development will be happening, you know, hopefully at the same time. And I guess uh, I, I would throw in a couple of things. One, we're getting to the end of a couple of these projects now where we've built the housing for them actually. And we have those conversations every day. I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, why did we spend money on that? I need this now. This is the thing that is long-term. And so we have those conversations in our post-disaster rebuilding homeowner programs, we decided we're not going to pay for landscaping. We're not going to pay for granite counters. We're not going to pay for things that people can come do later. We're going to pay for fortified construction. We're going to pay for elevation, things that people would probably not do later or couldn't. It's not feasible. And so how do we build in that resilience and let them cover the cost of some of those amenities in the future? It, it felt really great designing those things in in the beginning. And now when we're getting to the end and we need money to do other things, it's, it's, it, there are certainly regrets there. And with respect to scattered site development, we have done a little bit of that. It's oddly not uh, less expensive somehow, but it is uh, it is a lot more resilient for the reasons you've you've mentioned, right? You you the the highest places, the safest places are the ones that were developed first in cities and towns. And so if we can go do scattered sites in town where all the infrastructure's there already, um, we're also getting people to safer places. So we're we're definitely looking at that. Go ahead. Thank you so much. This was incredible presentations. Um, my name is Corinne. I work for the city of Philadelphia, um, and I'm working with the repetitive loss community in Southwest Philly. And um, the homes there are all attached. There's eight or ten houses in a row, and we're experiencing challenges where we have, you know, we don't have a buyout program in, in Philadelphia. But if we did, we would be constrained to have everybody kind of participate together. And I am curious if that's a challenge that New Jersey DEP has run into with the Blue Acres um, program, and if you've found any ways to build in any flexibility or, you know, individual choices to allow some flexibility for um, for a situation like that. So um, thank you for that question, and that is tough. Um, I will say yes, we've encountered it, um, and probably didn't handle it as well as we should have. Um, you know, we realized that when you're talking about adjoined properties, there's a lot of sort of dynamics that go with that, whether or not they share kind of a common firewall. Um, that indicates whether or not you can actually demolish part of it. Um, we've also had issues where even when they didn't share a common firewall, um, and, and you could sort of successfully demolish the structure's integrity, like how just what condition it was in might have made it so precarious that you couldn't demolish even if you wanted to. So, um, you know, there's a lot of layers to that. We have a policy that requires um, conjoined homeowners to both participate in the process simultaneously. So they both have to be voluntarily interested. Um, they also get offers at the same time and they go to contract contingent on closing with one another. 
Um, it's not a perfect solution, though, I will be honest. And I know if you're talking about it in kind of multiples, um, it's, it's a real challenge. But I think this is also where you could be creative in sort of using supplements to buyout offers to kind of encourage those other homeowners, um, you know, to kind of participate and get on board because, you know, maybe three out of the five are interested um, and the other two, you know, if you just kind of sweeten the deal might come along and then you can be successful with what you want. I think it could also be really useful if there's another place where there is existing housing that you could put them in that is already conjoined as sort of a referral option. I think sometimes that can go a long way to getting people who are hesitant to, um, to make a really difficult choice. I don't know, do you guys have any examples of what? Just the, the, really the same thing. We have incentives where uh, it, in all likelihood, if, if you want to buy them out, their property values are probably depressed because they flood or something like that. And so uh, what we do is, is come up with a, a cost per square foot average for the area in safe locations. And we, we are, offer that to folks instead of just what their fair market value is. And, and most of the time, that's a little bit of a boost and it gives them the money they need to go get a house in a safe place. And it might be the incentive that they need to leave where they are. And that so far, uh, we've got seven buyout, other buyout programs going on around the state. And so far, we've been really successful in getting the first priority folks to move because they flood all the time and they don't want to but if you can give them enough money to get a place in a safe place then mo our experience so far is that they will take it okay go ahead just don't please introduce yourself too oh great hi Corey wills um with resilience action partners oh can you hear me yeah okay um i'm curious about the move to to, to focus on single family housing rather than multifamily housing, apartment housing, and how, if at all, you're planning to accommodate renters. So um, I can say in, in the New Jersey example, a lot of our um, focus on, is on single family homes, mainly because some of the multifamily homes um, are eligible. So we will actually look at one to four units. So if there is a single family house that maybe at one time was split into multiple units, or if you do have kind of like a duplex or something like that with common ownership, those are eligible. Um, we do relocate tenants in accordance with the Uniform Relocation and Real Property Act. So tenants are um, in effect involuntarily displaced when their landlord chooses to sell for a buyout. So we will provide relocation assistance um, over it, historically, it's been about a 42 month period. Um, they also qualify for some assistance with uh, down payments or rental uh, security deposits, as well as moving costs and things like that. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the tenants have to be notified and informed. That's one of the URA requirements is that as you begin the process, you're very transparent, both with the landowner and with the occupant. Um, and making sure that you know they understand that if they are going to ultimately be displaced, there are resources to help them kind of make this transition. Um, I think we haven't looked at apartment buildings largely because it's very tricky. Um, I don't wanna say we won't. Um, I can tell you, I have one in my sites right now and I wanna kind of buy, it's just one of their units. Um, it's one of many several units, but I'd like to see if there's a way for us to kind of remove that because it literally sits directly on the, you know, um, on the, on the river. But again, we, we haven't been there yet. Um, I think it's a place to go. Um, it does get a little trickier if you can't get the, the sort of there are a lot of them are owned in New Jersey by like large corporations. You know, it's like a corporate entity that owns a lot of our apartment facilities. So they have to see the incentive to, to do this and to kind of figure out how they're gonna recoup costs if they've distributed out among all their different units. But, um, but it's certainly not something off the table. It's just something we really haven't gotten to yet as a program, um, but we're not certainly, you know, in terms of housing, no one should live in these kind of areas if they don't want to. Um, but at the same time, we have to figure out creative ways to do it. So hopefully that was the right answer. You're, I got all your questions, I guess I, sh I should say. And uh, we, so historically, the, the drivers for affordable rental housing have been cost per unit, right? If you had this competition among developers, it would be cost per unit. And so historically, we have driven affordable rental housing 
into the most dangerous places in our communities, at least in Louisiana. And so they flood and then they don't have a home for a year. And then we have a problem or two years or whatever. So our, our more recent, since 2016, affordable rental programs are all fortified gold construction and out of the 100 year floodplain. If they're in the 500 year floodplain, they have to be three feet above uh, natural ground or else out of the 500 year floodplain completely so that they can actually be have that resilient housing that they need to get back to their jobs and, and schools and lives and everything. That was a hard lesson learned. After Katrina, all the subsequent disasters, we saw time and time again that the, the affordable rental housing was the most damaged. Um, the other thing that I would say about the buyouts that we run into is when you go into a frequently flooded neighborhood and say, okay, we're gonna try to buy this out. There are inevitably landlords there too, who own these cheaper houses. And we don't wanna incentivize them with the same cost per square foot thing because they're business people, right? They made this investment knowingly apparently. Uh, but we still want them to participate so we can get them to move so we can reconnect this area to the wetlands. So we've got other incentive programs where we provide them uh, free mortgages, for instance, to go build something else or buy something else, as long as they'll rent it at affordable rates to low income households for a certain period of time. So we sort of buy their uh, uh, participation through a different way we get something else from them besides providing just a, a, a financial incentive which we don't mind giving to a homeowner who maybe you know just for they that was the only place they could afford and now they're flooding out and so you want to help them get back that opportunity to create generational wealth but still there are opportunities for other incentives for landlords to yeah, it's a good it's a good question, and I think it's an area that um, I can tell you from the past ten years, I've noticed more single family homes that were sort of owner occupied. The more they flood, the more they turn over to rentals. So you start to see that number kind of increase. The more people are impacted by flooding, because the primary occupant goes, "I've had enough. I'm taking my family and getting out, but I'm going to rent it." You know, and so we do need to be very mindful that that is a potential trend that, that kind of happens in some of these consistently flood prone areas. Um, in New Jersey, we also have a really strong relationship with our Department of Community Affairs, and they do have um, some repair assistance money for multifamily, and, and they kind of make part of our recovery efforts targeted to making those more resilient. And in some cases, it may mean like abandoning first floors of things and then really concentrating, um, you know, the rental units above. So I think it's it's trying to be dynamic in the way you address those kind of problems and also recognizing that sometimes it's not just one agency or effort that needs to kind of get involved. And I think that was what was really nice about some of what Pat shared is, you know, we got to get creative, right? And we've got to sort of incentivize other options to sort of help um, kind of solve that problem because we do recognize that a lot of buyout programs focus on ownership, you know, homeowners, but there are a lot of other occupants that are impacted by, by these programs and choices. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name's Ellen McCray, and I'm NOAA's Regional Climate Service Director for the Eastern Region. Um, but my question's actually as a Massachusetts resident um, who, run, who runs into a 40B thing, which is something that, Jim, I'm hoping you'll look up. But uh, Massachusetts 40B suggests that affordable housing is offered free zoning so they can bypass zoning restrictions if they offer 20% for affordable housing. So I'm wondering two questions, if you have a zoning bypass, and if you also could explain how you got to 70%, which is really great, because I can tell you what the builders do with the current rules. So I'm not familiar with 40B or our zoning process yet. Um, and the second part of the question, I'm sorry, what was that? The 70% meaning the, meeting the LMI criteria? I think so. Uh, just so how did you get how did you get to the seventy percent? Because I think that's a really great number compared to the twenty percent with forty B. Oh, okay. So that was something that was in our action plan that we wanted to meet. We need to meet seventy percent overall. 
throughout all of the programs that we developed through the IDA action plan. So it was really a programmatic decision that we wanted to hit 70% with this, LMI with this program. Do we have any online questions? I know there's online folks. So we have three online questions. The first one is, how did you get the projected flood levels accepted instead of current modeling? So uh, the, we have a, uh, an entire agency in Louisiana that looks just at coastal land loss and, and protection, and uh, they teamed up with a nonprofit to do three different sea level rise scenarios uh, plus, we have subsidence m measurements. We know how fast our ground is sinking. And uh, so they were able to combine all those things in, th in a model and, and determine what the 100-year flood levels would be. And I think that the chart that I showed you was with our coastal master plan implemented, which means we've built levees and wetlands and things like that and, and barrier islands and also it envisions, I think, the middle estimate of sea level rise. So, I mean, it, it's just an art, I, I think. Thank you. The next online question is, does New Jersey or other states have any programs targeting rehab or relocation of multifamily properties or programs targeting any renters in general? So yes, <laughs> yes um, James might be able to talk a little bit more detail. Um, DCA does have programs and they have a long history of doing that in the recovery context. Yeah, so we definitely have, we have a, another program through IDA that's strictly for homeowner, single family homeowner re uh, assistance. And then we have a uh, small rental repair program as well as now a multifamily program that's uh, in talks of being developed. So that's why we sp specifically focused on single family homes for smart move. Um, but yeah, there's there's a list of, I think uh, like 10 other programs that we have right now through our action plan. We might be able to put a link in the chat if people wanna take a look at the recovery site that has all that information. Perfect. The last online question is from Jesse Keenan in the hospital in New Orleans. Um, he says, I'm sorry to miss everyone. The question is for Pat Forbes. You mentioned the outdated nature of your demographic data. What are the demographic techniques that you are using to sample and survey out migration households? Are you collecting any data from these people in terms of characteristics and or preferences? I'm sorry. Can you read that again? Sure. That, that was a lot. I know. I, and I, I'm you mentioned the outdated nature of your demographic data. What are the demographic techniques that you are using to sample and survey out migration households? And are you collecting any data from these people in terms of char characteristics and or preferences? No, the, these are just census data. These are, uh, we, di we didn't do specific data gathering for those numbers. We just have populations of those towns it will change over time pre-Katrina to post-Katrina. So I think that's it, unless we have two minutes, but I think that's about it. Before we send you off and, you know, I, w I do want to do two things. One, I had kind of put a poll in on Tuesday, just asking folks who were thinking about attending or participating in the session, um, how they, you know, what they thought could be tools in this conversation. And I just, I wanted to recognize some of the responses. So just bear with me for a second. Uh, someone mentioned land swaps. Someone mentioned risk analysis. Someone mentioned collaboration. There was a TDR reference. Uh, so transfer of development rights program reference. There was an incentive advice. Um, and I think they, they meaning kind of like adding to the comp to um, getting people to, to participate. So incentives or incentivize. And then um, genuine public, I think, was the other one. So I wanted to thank anybody who responded to the poll. I think a lot of our conversation here is really to just kind of get additional dialogue, give you some examples of what a few states are trying to do. 
Um, it's by no means, you know, the end of this conversation. I think it's just the beginning. And, and I think as Pat mentioned earlier, we're all learning and trying to learn from each other and from many of you in the academic environment, as well as, you know, our federal partners and our, um, our local government partners. So um, I thank you all for your participation. Thanks again to James and to Pat. And um, with that, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.